My name is Susan Bro, and I have the distinct honour to be the Dean of the Faculty of Law at the University of Victoria. And today, it is a real pleasure to introduce one of my esteemed colleagues. Jeff Loomer is an Associate Professor at the Faculty of Law, where he has been since 2018. Prior to that, he's taught at the Schulich School of Law at the University of Dalhousie, um, and indeed his record of experience in international tax law and the talk he's going to give today is global tax cooperation a reality. You have the distinct pleasure of, of seeing a world expert in the field. Um, Jeff ob obtained his doctorate at the University of Oxford where he is still associated and he is also a esteemed member of a practice group at McCarthy Tetro, where he practiced international tax law. Uh, we are very fortunate to have Jeff in our faculty. He maintains a leadership role as the chair of our international committee. And I think you're going to very much enjoy his expertise in global tax law. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Dean Bro, for that very kind introduction. Thank you to the Faculty of Law and the Division of Continuing Studies for making this uh, lecture possible. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is the concept of global tax cooperation. Is it a reality? Is it not? Uh, I am a former tax lawyer and do research in the area of international tax mainly and I spend a lot of my day looking at uh, the intricacies of tax law but I'm not going to bore you with case law and statutory provisions. I'm going to talk more about the high-level geopolitical issues in international tax right now and some of the big changes that have happened particularly in the last decade because international crises seem to spur us on to new and better things including in tax. So just an overview of what I plan to talk about. Uh, a little bit about the current international tax policy environment. Historically what does it look like? What do we mean when we talk about the international tax system? Say a bit about tax competition and in contrast tax cooperation and importantly uh, distinguish the meanings of tax evasion and tax avoidance because there's been quite a bit of discussion about this in the media for the last 10 years which is exciting for someone like me to see your area of study discussed in the news uh, but sometimes there's a, a misuse of terminology so I'll just talk about what those things mean. Having done so I'll look at what's really interesting which is some of the recent tax policy developments when I say recent I mean really going back to late 2009 early 2010 up to very recently July 2020-21 and uh, in particular look at information sharing and the so-called base erosion and profit shifting BEPS project spearheaded by the OECD the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. I'll say briefly a bit about unilateral changes that is domestic changes the one you might have heard of is so-called digital sales taxes on things like Netflix DST and how those interact or don't with the international efforts that are ongoing. So I'll start with a discussion of the international tax policy environment as it has been and people often complain that it's much the same or it was much the same in 2010 as it was in 1930. Uh, there were decisions that were made internationally about allocation of taxing rights that stayed much the same for a good 80 years. What do we mean when we talk about the international tax system well, the standard view is there isn't one. There is no international tax system. There is no worldwide tax authority that imposes laws. There is no worldwide tax treaty. So that makes tax different than some other areas, for example, international trade. However, there is a quite sophisticated network of domestic laws that can affect transnational activity. That is, you know, Canada, US, Canada, Bermuda, whatever it might be. Uh, so in Canada, of course, we have the Income Tax Act. The U.S. has the Internal Revenue Code. Other countries have their own tax laws. Then we have a series of bilateral tax treaties, what are sometimes called double tax conventions, DTCs. Those are agreements to deal with a variety of transnational tax matters. There is not a worldwide DTC. Instead, we have a series of bilateral ones. So Canada has bilateral tax treaties with 94 jurisdictions now, one of the largest networks in the world. So for example, we have a treaty with France. And the terms of it look very similar to our treaty with the United States or our treaty with Japan. But you have to apply each separately. Then we have what are called tax information exchange agreements. These are more narrow. They're again international agreements, but they deal with a very 
narrow category, and that is information sharing. So, for example, Canada has a tax information exchange agreement with Bermuda, where the Canada Revenue Agency can request information from the Bermuda tax authorities, basically to identify if Canadians are meeting their tax obligations. And in theory, it works the other way around, although there's not much concern in Bermuda about people hiding money in Canada. Uh, there are also multilateral treaties, for example, in Nordic countries and the Caribbean community, because uh, they're culturally similar and because they're close together, they might, instead of having a series of treaties, have one to apply to a group of countries. More recently, we have newer multilateral agreements developed mainly by the OECD, also by uh, tax experts at the United Nations, trying to get more multilateral agreement. But it's still the case today that tax is largely a sovereign matter. It's seen as a critical aspect of a state sovereignty, the raising of public funds to provide public goods and services, uh, very important to each country, and countries are unwilling to give up jurisdiction in the absence of a great deal of negotiation and a great deal of cooperation from others. At the same time, of course, you have globalization, which is not a new phenomenon, and uh, we've seen this over the last century, easier movement of people, movement of capital across borders, dramatic growth of multinational enterprises. In the old days, the companies that people would talk about would be General Electric and Ford and that sort of thing. Today, it's Google and Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, etc. That is ongoing. Uh, in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s, the standard assumption was that that must imply tax competition. So, reduction of the tax base, that is what's taxable. Reduction of tax rates, especially for corporations. And that creates opportunities for tax avoidance because you have gaps in the system. We could move money here or there. You think about the large digital companies like Google or Amazon, Microsoft, Apple, etc. But this also can apply to companies that are more standard in nature, like Starbucks, that has you know, regular outlets and sells coffee. Large banks like UBS. Large mining companies, many of which are based in Canada, but on the slide I've shown, for example, Rio Tinto, based in Australia. Those companies, multinational enterprises more properly called, operate globally while tax functions largely on a domestic basis. That creates a lot of opportunities to reduce tax. Some countries have taken advantage of that. A notable example is Ireland, a member of the European Union, which has had a corporate tax rate of 12.5% for a long time and has done very well because of it. The largest corporations in Ireland are Apple, Google, Microsoft, some of the very large medical device companies, banks, etc. And that's been very good for the Irish economy, but causes displeasure among other members of the European Union, as well as the United States. What we see is worldwide crises of 2008-2009, the financial crisis, and more recently, the COVID pandemic, 2020-2021, countries realizing that we are in some sense connected and tax is one area where we have seen greater tax cooperation than we would have seen in the past. In 2014 to 2019, I was pessimistic about whether this was really producing anything. There seems to have been a shift in the last year towards greater cooperation on the big issues that actually matter, which is what I will get to later in this talk. Before I do that, I wanted to say a bit more about tax evasion and tax avoidance, and I won't spend a great deal of time on this. But to a lawyer, these are distinct legal concepts. They are often used interchangeably, or people say them beside each other. Uh, and in French, evasion and avoidance may indeed mean the same thing. In English, when we talk about tax evasion, we mean criminal behavior. That is something that's fraudulent. You know you have income that you're supposed to report on your Canadian tax return. You don't report it. That is criminal behavior and you can be subject to criminal prosecution, penalties, possibly jail time, although that's more likely in the United States. When we talk about tax avoidance, we mean a range of things, some kind of sophisticated or creative or some would say aggressive interpretation and application of the laws to minimize one's tax payable. Those are different things in that the latter is legal, unless determined otherwise by a court, in our case in Canada, the Tax Court of Canada, However, there are similarities in that both activities often involve money or entities based in tax havens, offshore jurisdictions, secrecy jurisdictions such as Bermuda, Cayman Islands, Switzerland, and so on. And both activities can result in large revenue losses for other states, such as Canada, United States, Japan, 
other relatively high tax countries that want their residents to pay income tax or corporate income tax at home. Now, organizations like the uh, Tax Justice Network have done a lot of advocacy work, advocacy work to point out the degree to which tax havens are used by individuals and by multinationals, the degree of revenue loss that is occasioned by that activity. We know about major leaks to media organizations, most recent being the Panama Papers, an absolutely massive uh, leak of documents illustrating uh, various offshore activities conducted through a particular law firm in Panama, but involving countries all around the world. Uh, a lot of the activity that's revealed there might involve tax evasion, but more likely, in the examples I've looked at, does not. It involves rather sophisticated tax avoidance. What uh, Doreen McBarnett, the University of Oxford, describes as creative compliance. That is, structuring your affairs so that on a particular interp interpretation of the law, it is not quite illegal. Uh, therefore, it is legal. And those in favor of it will usually use the word perfectly. It is perfectly legal. That adjective doesn't really add anything to it at all. It is legal or not legal. Um, and countries struggle to deal with both evasion and avoidance, but avoidance is the more complicated issue. And I'll show another example here, if you'll bear with me. Uh, that diagram on the left, I've taken from CBC News. It was an infographic they did at the time of the Panama Papers leak, how to create a shell company. So it's you know, intended to be a bit amusing. Choose a tax haven, Switzerland and Cayman Islands, they show there. Uh, more likely British Virgin Islands, frankly. Create a corporation or trust or some other entity. Hire a nominee, so someone who runs it that uh, disguises your ownership of it. Open a bank account. Could be there, could be another country. Common example uh, in reality is a British Virgin Islands company that has a Swiss bank account. Very common. Move money into that account, spend the money. <laughs> now, there's an important step that's left out of here in this infographic, which is between move money into the account and spend the money. The part that actually involves the illegality is Moving money into a foreign account is not in itself illegal in Canada, it's not illegal in the US, in most of the world it's legal. The issue is if you are moving large sums into a foreign entity, foreign bank account, earning investment returns on it and not reporting it. So moving a million dollars into a Swiss bank account is not in itself illegal. If you earned a 10% return on that in the year, so 100 grand, which would be pretty good, uh, and don't, don't report it. If you're a Canadian resident or a US citizen and you don't report that on your tax return, that's the evasion. That is, when one looks through the documents, surprisingly rare to see. And that is likely because the people who are doing that aren't documenting what they are doing. It's very hidden. Uh, it's often organized crime. They're not concerned about the law on other matters, and they're certainly not concerned about reporting their income for tax purposes. The activity that we do know about is much more like what I've shown on the right here. And I won't get into provisions of Canadian tax law, but those boxes are meant to represent corporations. They might not, they might be other entities, but let's assume they're corporations because they usually are. Canada Co. is a parent company. Maybe it's involved in mining, banking, some other financial services, healthcare. It's headquartered in Canada. It owns another company in Luxembourg, which is a separate entity, which in turn owns a company in India that carries on an active business in India. The Canadian company also owns this special purpose company in Bermuda that owns, for example, intellectual property or makes loans. Let's say the India company carries on an active business in India, manufactures mobile phones, manufactures vaccines. Who knows what it does? It's earning profits and it's subject to a relatively high tax rate in India, corporate tax between 25 and 40 percent. So the smart folks up at Canada Co. say, well, India Co. will borrow money to use in its business, it needs to borrow money, it will borrow money from Bermuda Co. Or it will use some sort of patent or other intellectual property owned by Bermuda Co. It will pay interest on the loan or it will pay royalties on the intellectual property over to Bermuda. Under Indian law, that's likely a deductible expense. Reducing profit in India, therefore reducing tax in India. Okay, but it's going to be taxed in Bermuda, is it not? The tax rate is zero. Corporate tax rate is zero, therefore the income will be subject to zero tax. Okay, well Canada's going to be concerned about this, right? It's an erosion of the Indian tax base. No. The Canadian rules allow that money to come back to Canada Co. as a tax-free dividend. So this is an example of how 
corporate tax is reduced, perhaps not to zero, but is reduced as close as possible to zero by multinationals who have the ability to use companies in different jurisdictions, relying on differences in domestic law, differences in tax treaties. Canada is well aware that this sort of transaction goes on, and far from being concerned about, quote, clamping down on it, the rules that we have in place facilitate and encourage this activity, at least for companies that have their headquarters in Canada. The theory being, it doesn't hurt us, it only hurts India. And it doesn't have to be India, it could be Germany, it could be the United States, it could be Japan, China, etc. From Canada's perspective, it's enhancing the profitability of a Canadian-based multinational. That is a similar pattern that you might see in other countries who've got the same incentives where they would like to assist multinationals that are based in their own country if it doesn't cost them anything. It costs tax to the rest of the world. So before I look at recent developments, I just wanted to show some statistics from uh, Statistics Canada about foreign direct investment numbers, which matches and that perhaps shows what I'm talking about in that previous diagram. This is foreign direct investment into Canada. So foreign investors making large corporate investments. So you can think about you know, Home Depot US investing in Home Depot Canada or Walmart or Costco or something like that. Not surprisingly, the major origin country is our major trading partner, the United States, and it's been number one for the longest time. Number two is Netherlands, number three is UK, number four is Luxembourg and Switzerland, then Japan. These are all countries that Canada has a domestic, uh, that has a double tax treaty with, excuse me. Uh, and there's reasons for that. The treaty makes it easy for money to move back and forth. Uh, the prevalence of Netherlands and Luxembourg and Switzerland may surprise you. If we look at foreign direct investment from Canada moving ahead, it's perhaps even more startling. Where is the money from Canada going to? Number one, United States. Not surprising. Number two is the United Kingdom. Number three is Luxembourg, then Bermuda, then Cayman Islands. Australia is creeping up in the list of importance. For the longest time, through the 80s and 90s, number three was Barbados. That was because Barbados was a country that Canada has, still has, a tax treaty with, with a tax rate on international business companies of 2.5%. But Canada signed agreements with Bermuda and the Cayman Islands going back to 2011 that have allowed dividends like in the structure I showed on the previous slide to be returned to Canada tax-free. It's not surprising that Bermuda and Cayman Islands are moving up that list because Bermuda has a 0% corporate tax rate. It's also a shorter flight from Toronto than Barbados. Um, those countries obviously are important in international finance. They're relatively small in terms of population and land mass, but they're very important in terms of Canadian foreign direct investment. This is a picture of disclosed corporate investment. This is not rich folks hiding money in Bermuda and Switzerland. That's not disclosed in this chart. This is corporate investment that is disclosed. This is where uh, the avoidance is going on if you look at particularly countries like Luxembourg, Bermuda, and Cayman Islands. And that's just from the perspective of Canada. Obviously the numbers are bigger if we're talking about a larger economy like the United States, UK, Germany, Japan. So what are Canada and other countries doing about international tax evasion and international tax avoidance? The latter being, of course, a more difficult problem to deal with. Let me address each of those in turn. On the evasion side, so again, this is criminal behavior. This is a dark underworld of people who have money to invest, stick it in a foreign account, and they're not interested in reporting it even though they know their obligations, they're generally aware of their obligations at home. Um, that was certainly a concern through the 20th century and there have been great strides actually in dealing with this matter since the 2008-2009 financial crisis. Although the financial crisis was not really caused by tax evasion, the causes of the financial crisis are debated of course, but tax havens, particularly financial offshore jurisdictions, were at the center of a lot of the concerns, particularly the Cayman Islands and the British Virgin Islands. So at the G20 meeting in London 2009, the G20 leaders declared that the era of banking secrecy is over. People were initially skeptical, including me. But what we have seen since then is a great deal of cooperation to share information. 
In particular, we've seen a massive expansion of tax information exchange agreements. In the United States, they have their own statute called the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act, FATCA, but it operates in the same way. The idea is you must disclose foreign bank accounts as a U.S. citizen, and there can be all sorts of problems if you don't, and it forces foreign countries to share information with the U.S., otherwise they face punitive taxes on their operations in the U.S. Now, Canada doesn't have the clout of the U.S. to do such a thing. Instead, we have agreed with uh, various countries to sign tax information exchange agreements. So I mentioned earlier how we have one with Bermuda. That's one of the earliest ones we have, going back to 2011. Cayman Islands, British Virgin Islands, Bahamas, Panama, etc. We now have tax information exchange agreements with 24 different jurisdictions. And what that allows, again, is a sharing of information. So the Canada Revenue Agency can say to the Bermuda authorities, we have reason to suspect that Jeff Loomer is hiding a million dollars in his Bermuda account and not reporting the returns. Can you please provide information about him? And they will do so under some restrictions. There are all sorts of privacy requirements, but if there is a, what in criminal law they would call a probable cause that you have information that, that uh, is valid and that this person is not reporting their income, then the foreign authorities will report on that. More recently, we've moved to automatic information exchange. So what that means is, for example, Switzerland, does not have to be asked by Canada or the US to report on the bank account holdings of some individual or some corporation or some trust. They will automatically exchange it with their partners, including Canada. So what that means now, practically, is that the Swiss authorities each year will provide a massive data dump to, for example, Canada of accounts that are believed to be held ultimately by Canadians. I imagine for the people within the Canada Revenue Agency who have to go through this, it's a huge task because they're basically getting spreadsheets, enormous amounts of data, and they just have to look for irregularities. Because again, having a bank account in Switzerland is fine. You may have family there. You may have uh, lived there previously. Or you just like the idea of having an account there. That's fine. Uh, but people at the CRA have to go through that stuff to try to identify abnormalities to determine if someone is failing to disclose investment income. So that now happens automatically, which is a great stride forward. The OECD has its own convention on mutual administrative assistance in tax matters. That is designed to uh, basically consolidate these agreements and make sure that there is mutual assistance. So for example, between Switzerland and Canada. 144 jurisdictions have now signed on to that convention, which is quite encouraging. It includes Canada. It includes the United States. It includes China. It includes Russia. These are countries that in many geopolitical matters do not agree, but on this they do, uh, because no one is interested in having its residents evading tax, uh, unless the government itself is evading tax in a corrupt country. But let's assume that you actually are concerned about your citizens evading tax. It's been easy, relatively easy, to get agreement on this. So that's, I think, a positive sign of global tax cooperation is good in principle. One thing negative you might say about it is that it is hard to point to the practical results of this so far. So in Canada's case, um, there was a request by uh, NDP members of parliament to the Department of Finance about what is actually happening with uh, these disclosures of information. And the response uh, last year was that after analyzing some 450 billion of transfers, electronic funds transfers over a period of four years uh, between Canada and various uh, foreign jurisdictions. A lot of audits happened, that is the CRA followed up and asked people questions. But the number of criminal prosecutions was zero. The number of people convicted of tax evasion in Canada over that period of time based on these international uh, disclosures, zero. Uh, so there are people who complain about that and say, well, it's not really working. The positive way to look at that is uh, people are not being prosecuted but those who would be inclined to evade are scared. They have started to come forward with what's called a voluntary disclosure where they report their previously undisclosed income to the Canada Revenue Agency and there are similar systems in other countries. They pay the tax, they pay interest, they avoid penalties, they avoid going to jail. The other possibility is in many cases these international funds transfers don't involve anything illegal. Uh, it's just that people have international businesses, so there's nothing to prosecute them for. 
So in principle, this sharing of information is a good thing. In practice, very difficult to manage all the data. And in practice, we see very little in the way of actual criminal results. The bigger issue, though, in terms of revenue, tax revenue involved, is tax avoidance by multinational enterprises. As I said earlier, this is a different thing legally than tax evasion. There are people who say it's a worse problem. Uh, it might be legal, but in terms of revenue loss, it's much larger. The OECD has estimated that the amount of revenue loss from multinational tax avoidance is between 100 billion and 240 billion US per year. Now that's globally. The Canada Revenue Agency suggests with uh, you know, a great deal of estimation that Canada's share of that in terms of corporate revenue, corporate tax revenue lost, is about 11 billion. And that was for 2014. It might be higher today. The Base Erosion and Profit Shifting Project, BEPS project, is all about trying to address that. So the OECD itself defines base erosion and profit shifting, as I've said there on the slide, as tax planning strategies that exploit gaps and mismatches in rules to artificially shift profits to low or no tax locations where there is little or no economic activity. So the example I gave earlier of funds moving through Bermuda could be an example of this. It's legal, but it exploits gaps to minimize tax payable. Now the OECD worked very hard to produce what they called a number of actions, a number of reports on different topics like controlled foreign companies and other topics that I won't get into, uh, mostly by October 2015. Without getting into the details, the overall themes of those reports were to better align corporate income tax with value creation. That is, you have this multinational like Apple, where are your employees? Where are things actually happening? rather than where does a letterbox company own some intellectual property. The other major theme was to improve information reporting and dispute resolution, which I said is already happening on the evasion side, but the idea was to make this also happen with the large multinationals. The BEPS project originally began as an OECD project, which is a limited number of wealthy countries. It was expanded in 2016, so now it's referred to as the OECD G20 Inclusive Framework on BEPS. The idea is to include a much wider range of countries, so it includes all of the G20 countries, and various other developing countries around the world are part of the Inclusive Framework. Uh, that is, at last, last count, 139 different jurisdictions uh, are involved in the Inclusive Framework. And there's broad agreement about dealing with international tax avoidance. I'll highlight a couple of them. I don't have time to go through all of them. Following action 13, which is all about information sharing, there's been wide adoption of what's called country by country reporting for large enterprises. These are quite large, so the threshold is where revenue of the corporate group exceeds 750 million euros, which is about a billion Canadian. So we're talking very large companies. Uh, the idea here is just that there should be information sharing. Not saying anybody's doing anything wrong, but sharing information about where your profits are, how much tax you paid in those countries. So for example, maybe the parent company is in the United States, maybe it's a mining company, maybe it has operations in Nigeria. What were your profits in Nigeria? How much tax did you pay in Nigeria? The authorities in Nigeria would like to know that. The tax paid might be much lower than you would think it should be given the activity there. So, this is really just information sharing to let revenue authorities follow up and see if they might want more information from the company itself. Canada has enacted rules to uh, impose those requirements because the OECD BEPS reports are just recommendations from an international organization. They're not law. Canada has enacted rules of that nature and various other countries have as well. More recently, following BEPS Action 15, we have what's called the MLI, the Multilateral Instrument. That is a treaty to amend treaties. Uh, an odd aspect of international law, but it's a treaty to amend treaties where if you sign on, like Canada has, you agree to amend your various bilateral tax treaties. As I said, we have 94 of them. So rather than the OECD trying to amend each of them, what they did was have everyone sign an agreement that will, in effect, automatically amend all of your treaties. So Canada signed and ratified that. 95 other countries have signed as of August 2021. Uh, not all of them have ratified. And notably absent from that list is the United States. 
they have not signed on to it. Uh, that doesn't mean Canada is necessarily uh, the shining light here because although we've signed and ratified, we've entered many, many reservations on that instrument. In other words, places where we said this provision doesn't apply, this provision doesn't apply. We've limited it to just a few things that we saw to be in our benefit. So our position is actually not that different than the Americans, I would suggest. The OECD project, BEPS project, continues to evolve and the major concern they had dealt with in BEPS Action 1 was what they called the digitalization of the economy. And that was in 2015. Even more so today, when you think about the companies that have prospered with people being at home during the pandemic and so on, it's the digital companies like Google, Apple, Amazon, and others that um, now are the largest companies in the world. How their profits would be taxed uh, in a modern environment was what BEPS Action 1 tried to address and they realized it would be very difficult. What the OECD has moved on with is what they're calling the two-pillar framework. Uh, and the idea here is to really rework fundamental issues about the way the international tax system works. So it's divided into two pillars, which I'll explain just at a high level. Uh, pillar 1 is all about providing enhanced tax jurisdiction to market economies by altering traditional rules about nexus in a country and traditional rules about profit allocation. So for example, the rules that have existed for taxing international corporate income going back to the 1930s are based largely on physical presence in a country or employees in a country. So whether you establish a company there or if you don't have a company there, you have an office, you have people. Uh, even if you don't have an office, you have agents who operate, human beings who operate on your behalf in that country. But if you are Google, Alphabet Inc, and your major source of revenue is advertising or leveraging user data and all the different ways Google makes money, you can make a lot of money in a large economy like France or Japan without having a single office or a single employee in the country. And so under traditional rules, a company like Google may pay zero corporate income tax in a country where it has a massive market. And that has been a concern for many years, but it's become particularly acute with the realization of just how much money these companies can make. And the people at Google themselves would say, yeah, we recognize that's a strange system, and as long as the rules change for everyone, we're happy to abide by them. So pillar one is about that. It's about trying to provide enhanced tax rights for market economies. Pillar two is sort of a backup what they've called the Global Anti-Base Erosion Proposal, which is where we hear about this minimum corporate tax rate. This is for things like royalties on patents and that sort of thing, to ensure that there's some minimum level of tax that's paid and that income is not allowed to be shifted around the world into places like Bermuda or the Cayman Islands or other places where they might pay zero corporate tax. Now, many countries already have rules to try to address this from their own perspective. So Canada has rules, the U.S. has rules, including the amusingly named guilty rules that go after intangible income, such as royalties, ta um, tax perhaps at a zero or close to zero rate. So that was the idea of Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 proposed in 2019 with details to follow. Initially, and so particularly through 2020, it seemed that this was unlikely to result in real change because the preferred approaches of the European Union countries and the USA were very different and they seemed irreconcilable, especially for Pillar 1. And perhaps you can understand from the US perspective, most of the companies that would be affected by this, that is the large digital companies, are headquartered in the United States. Apple, Google, Microsoft, and so on. Although they all have significant presence in Ireland, their headquarters are largely in the United States. The U.S. administration saw this proposal as essentially a shift of tax revenue from the United States to the rest of the world, particularly the EU as well as Japan and China. However, somewhat to the commentators and observers' surprise, agreement was reached on a two-pillar solution in July of this year. Um, this is partly due to the change of administration in the United States and more willingness to negotiate. Also, 
the thresholds were changed to make it more palatable to people, so it's quite limited in terms of its application. But as of July 1, 2021, there was an agreement and a statement made by the OECD Inclusive Framework on a two-pillar solution. How's that going to work? Well, it's very new and the details are yet to be worked out. But pillar one on profit allocation is narrowed in its scope. So it will apply to multinational enterprises with group revenues above 20 billion euros, which is a very limited group of companies and profitability above 10%. That is, they're, they're making really excessive profits over their um, costs. Uh, when I looked at this a few days ago, the amount of multinationals that would be captured by that threshold above 20 billion revenue is about 300. Uh, so it would include uh, the huge uh, digital giants, Google, Apple, Microsoft, etc., and also um, some of the large healthcare companies, banks, Walmart, Costco would be included in there. Excluded from the new rules will be resource extraction, so mining, natural gas, and so on and regulated financial services. Uh, I do wonder if uh, in Canada there was some celebration of that because the largest companies we have in Canada are resource extraction and regulated financial and they will now be excluded so they don't have to deal with this uh, headache of complicated new rules. I'm not saying that's a good thing um, and the US pushed for no exclusions uh, but the eventual compromise was to exclude those two industries from the new rules. Pillar two uh, is the one that you might have heard about in the news, global anti-base erosion rules. The idea is that for larger MEs, so with revenues above 750 million euros, so with lower threshold, the same as the country by country reporting threshold, there will be a minimum corporate tax rate of 15% on some kinds of income. The idea here is really uh, income on intangibles, interest on loans, things that are very mobile and easy to move anywhere in the world and typically flow to companies in zero tax jurisdictions. The idea is to have a minimum rate of 15% on that kind of income. Just for comparison, the uh, global average corporate tax rate as reported by the OECD is about 24%. The EU average is a bit less at about 21%. Um, that statement of agreement on pillar one and pillar two uh, was initially agreed by a group of countries and it's been extended as more sign on, more, most recently Barbados signed on, so it's 133 jurisdictions as of August 2021. The notable exception, the uh, holdout that is of some interest is Ireland, who um, so far have not agreed to the um, two pillar proposal. Remember that Ireland, uh, quite a corporate hub and has been for decades, has a corporate tax rate of 12.5% and they're not interested in a global minimum of 15%. Although we'll see if international pressure causes them to have to eventually agree. So far they have not. Uh, to conclude, I just want to say a few words about unilateral tax policy changes that people might be aware of and compare those to what's going on with Pillar 1 and Pillar 2, particularly Pillar 1. Because various countries have introduced or are about to introduce what are called digital services taxes. France did this at 3% in 2019, UK did it at 2% rate, various other countries, mostly in the EU, but also uh, India and Turkey, have introduced digital services taxes. Canada uh, has proposed a 3% digital services tax to begin next year, 2022. So what is this? It's the same idea as you see with Pillar 1 from the OECD. The idea is Google, Apple, you may have a large amount of revenue from the Canadian market, but you don't pay any income tax here because you don't have offices, you don't have employees. They are in the US or elsewhere. But you have this massive market of consumers here. It seems unfair that you don't pay any income tax. So the current income tax rules and the way our treaties work wouldn't allow that. There have been attempts to change, but it hasn't worked so far. So instead, countries have gone it on their own and said, well, we're gonna introduce a new kind of tax, digital services tax that just applies to the revenue that you derive within our jurisdiction from our market. The United States is strongly opposed to countries unilaterally doing this for the same reasons I mentioned before. And the hope is that if there is agreement on pillar one of the OEC proposal to allocate tax to market jurisdictions, that countries like France and the UK and Canada will do away with these. In Canada's case, perhaps before we even enact it. 
A slightly different thing is the expanded application of sales tax. So in Canada, we call GST or HST in some provinces. In Europe, it's typically called value-added tax, VAT. As you may know, GST has been extended to apply to your Netflix subscription or your Spotify subscription or other digital subscriptions as of July 2021. It had already been introduced provincially in Quebec and Saskatchewan and most recently BC. So for those of us in British Columbia, you'll be aware that you started paying 12% tax on your Netflix subscription as of July this year. That was already being done in most of the world and is sensible um, from a tax policy perspective. If GST applies to other goods and services, there's no reason it shouldn't apply to uh, digital subscriptions. That's a different thing than a digital services tax. And the companies like Netflix and others are bothered about possibly being subject to both of these taxes. And the hope is, although the GST will remain, that the digital services tax will disappear with agreement under Pillar 1. So to conclude, I've said a lot here and I think um, what I'd like people to take away is that prior to 2010, the international tax system was characterized largely by competition. There was a lot of talk about tax competition. Canada was uh, certainly in that, talking about lower rates and how we have to enhance our advantage and all that sort of thing. And profit shifting by multinationals to avoid tax in higher tax countries. Cooperation to combat evasion, so that is the people operating in the darkness, hiding money, literally not reporting income that they know they're supposed to report. That is much more difficult today because there's been a great deal of cooperation post-2009, including in Canada, to deal with that. Uh, and sometimes people would ask, well, why would a country like Bermuda or Switzerland and others that profited from this, why would they agree? Um, there really was an international tide that they couldn't stand against. They basically had to sign on to these things. And frankly, for a country like Switzerland or Bermuda, their argument would be, we don't want to be a haven for criminals. That's not our goal. Our goal is to be an international financial center. We'd rather have Apple and Google and Microsoft and other large companies like that doing legitimate business at a low tax rate in our country than helping criminals evade tax. So there's been a lot of cooperation on that matter. Cooperation regarding avoidance, what the OECD calls base erosion, has definitely happened more slowly. I have been skeptical and other people have been skeptical that much would change because of the self-interest of countries, including Canada, to maintain our tax advantages for companies based from our country. And certainly the United States would be in that position as well. However, uh, there is evolution. Cooperation is occurring. The BEPS project is, I think, internationally a great success. Uh, the details of Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 are still to come through late 2021. Plan is for more details to be proposed in 2022 and for these new measures to be put into law, if countries agree with them, effective 2023. We're likely to see domestic resistance in some countries, certainly in Ireland and certainly in the United States, because they may stand to lose. If those rules are enacted, hopefully that will mean unilateral digital sales taxes uh, go away. If and when those rules are enacted, yes, we'll have greater cooperation, but it is not clear right now which countries will gain or lose. Uh, the hope is that market countries will get a fairer share of uh, international tax revenue that they have not obtained under the rules that have been in place for most of the last century. So thank you very much. I will leave it there.